The first thing we did when we started this project was to walk the entire site. So we put on our boots and hiked through the mud and the snow on a cold January day and walked 2.2 miles in this abandoned corridor and documented it, took it all in, and just tried to establish um, you know, a sense of the place. It was cold, dark, shadowy, but there was this life that existed and you could see part of that life that existed in you know, the rails that were still, still in the ground, some of the old equipment that was still there, uh, the way the building sort of fronted that corridor, you knew that there was something that existed there before. So that, w that was our first sense of this place and uh, sort of formulated this basis for you know, bringing back this life that was there at one time. The city wants to reestablish the streetcar and the connectivity that, is, that used to exist in Salt Lake City in the 19-teens and 20s. Salt Lake City had one of the most extensive streetcar lines systems in the United States. So this is their first step into this renaissance of the streetcar. Welcome aboard. This train will be leaving shortly. Public involvement was um, a big part of this project from the from the start, and the first public meeting was really, you know, developing or presenting our initial concepts to the public and getting reaction uh, to those ideas. And the first meeting we had a section through the corridor, through the greenway. It was about a you know, an eight foot wide section, but it showed everything that we had programmed into that greenway. It showed the rail, uh, the strolling path, the uh, multimodal path. People really, uh, you know, they stood on it. They could feel what the greenway was gonna feel like. And then they responded to that. They put down their feelings, their thoughts, what they liked, what they disliked. And so that really was uh, one of the first things we used um, to come up with a plan. traveled to New York and looked at the High Line and used that as our primary precedent for this project. So this, this was a little bit different in that the S Line is uh, on the ground, it's in an existing corridor, it's not elevated above, um, but we, we looked at the High Line as something that you know, would form the basis for this project, something that was very green, you know, bringing something rural almost into this existing urban fabric, so. So here at the end of the line at McClellan and about Sugarmont and Sugar House, uh, we have the beginning of what we call the S-Line Greenway, the uh, alpine theme of our landscape design from here to about 500 east. This section is the beginning of the Greenway. We conceptualized this design uh, running from east to west, just like water here in the Salt Lake Valley. We have snow that falls in the mountains and runs from east to west into the Great Salt Lake. We wanted to create a landscape that represented 
the first part of where that water fell. So you have these, uh, these aspens, though they're not native aspens, these are a, a European uh, Swedish aspen. They can tolerate the lower altitudes and uh, warmer temperatures compared to our native indigenous aspens. We have some granite boulders. These were brought in by the artists, but uh, they also to us represent the glacial moraines that you would find in the canyons. And then from these boulders, we move into the meadow. And in the alpine meadow, you'd have uh, grasses, some mountain spirea, some columbines, just different plants that you would find at these higher elevations. And we brought them down here to, again, mimic that, that design of the alpine section of the Greenway. The history of this corridor has been predominantly rail, uh, and bringing back the streetcar uh, created a opportunity to bring back some of that history in an active use. So you have the streetcar, you have these wonderful pieces designed by Infinite Scale, CRSA and the RDA and South Salt Lake. You'll find some other pieces down in their, in their, their, their platform. So they kind of end both sections of this project and refer to the history that's uh, long standing here in Sugar House and South Salt Lake. So as we descend down the Alpine Meadows, we come into this area where we start collecting some, some gravel, some boulders, and those represent a rivulet or runnel. As you descend from the mountains, as water starts percolating through all the different crevices and cracks, they start forming into little rivulets and streams. And from those, we, uh, we begin our descent down the canyon. This not only mimics maybe what you might see in the alpine meadows of the mountains, but it acts as a functional piece for water collection. Uh, any of the water that hits the hard surfaces here in the corridor is collected and gathered in these what we call rain, rain gardens or rainwater harvesting landscape areas. And they act as clean filtration systems for our stormwater that we have in these, these urban environments. Uh, this sculpture behind me, a lot of people mistakenly call it the duck. This is the seagull for Utah's state bird. Uh, this is another Mike Whiting original in his style of pixelated animals. He constructed this out of steel, fabricated it himself, painted it, installed it uh, with a crane here from the other side of the, the fence and uh, it's a very cute piece. We've come from the alpine section where we just saw the rain gardens and uh, the alpine design scheme for the landscaping plan. We now enter what we call the mountain brush section of the greenway and in this section we again have a lot of native plants that you would see in a, a lower elevation here in the Wasatch Front. Uh, it also is somewhat drought tolerant and adaptive to this climate. We have a, um, a green screen is what we call it behind us. It's a metal trellis fence more or less. Uh, we've done this for a couple reasons. One, to prevent graffiti from happening on this uh, property behind me uh, to at least deter people from spraying and tagging their building. And two, because we're in a plaza area, there's less softscape less vegetation, so we wanted to add another layer of green. We've chosen the Acer Grissium, which is the paper bark maple. You can see by looking at the, the bark how it peels back. Uh, looks like paper parchment peeling back. So eventually we'll get some nice shade and coverage here, but uh, as you can see, they're, they're brand new and they have some years to grow. This sculpture behind me, uh is called Sugar House. It's a literal uh, representation of the neighborhood Sugar House. It's, this is meant to represent sugar cubes. And we, we like it as a portal 
into both the neighborhood, like a, a gateway welcoming symbol uh, of the neighborhood, and also a, uh, a portal to the path, which is uh, the S line. The, the artist, Mike Whiting, this is in his style of public sculpture, which is to design pixelated, simplified versions of objects as if they were in an 80s video game. So this fit, to, to make this out of sugar cubes, fit his aesthetic and his resume of, of sculptures that he's already made. So this is a pretty interesting section of the corridor right here. It gives us uh, some distinct views of uh, the design schemes we came up with. What you have in front of you is another rain garden type landscape. We've added in some rail and ties to give reference to the rail that used to be here. Continuing west, you'll see a distinct difference between the grasses. We have a flatter, nicely trimmed uh, turf grass that allows people to kind of play and enjoy leisurely activities. And then next to it, we have more of this bio-native grass, which is a little bit longer. We've designed that specifically, one, to create some interest, but two, as this track expands and the ridership increases, uh, the plans are to add a second lane of track. And that would mean tearing up a bunch of landscapes so we didn't plan for any trees or larger shrubs, but instead just did the simple grasses to allow for change of uses. This sculpture behind me, we've all, always called Snowman or Boulder Man. We also call it uh, Boulder Cairn uh, as a giant stack of uh, trail marker stones, uh, which is appropriate to this part of the trail you see here. About 40,000 pounds altogether. Very difficult to excavate from the mountainside. Because of these wires, we couldn't do the um, smart thing and bring a, a crane. We had to use uh, massive forklifts, the heaviest for forklifts that you can get. And we had to uh, wheel them in this alleyway and we built a very sturdy uh, concrete base uh, that it's drilled into, so it, it's very secure. Some other key interesting features that people will notice is this nice little kind of gutter just to the right of me, south of the trail. Uh, that is what we call the reel. What it does is all the water that hits this sidewalk will run off, hit that reel, go on down the reel, it will get piped underneath the sidewalk, and then over to this side into these landscape basin areas to again allow for that water to infiltrate into the groundwater and not just be pushed into other stormwater systems uh, creating more runoff pollution and that sort of thing. Uh, these are called Autumn Joy Sedum and being that it's September they're now blooming and they have these very thick blooms which the bees and other pollinators just love. So. You can see them, They're, they just get really crazy. I can come up here and pet one of those guys and no harm, no foul. They don't get too upset. But the, these are great plants for pollinators. And again, one reason why we've put them in the corridor, another reason is they give this nice distinct red color, which separates it from the other plantings that you see here. So these are our trains. Uh, it's called the Jupiter and the 119, which are the train engines that met for the transcontinental Railroad. We found two really huge long boulders to represent the train engines and we constructed these uh, these smokestacks from steel to to mimic the the distinctive shapes of, of those two trains. As I leave the mountain brush scheme of the Greenway, you'll see a lot of different tactile and colors in the hardscape. I'm leaving, leaving the plaza area, entering the sidewalk made for pedestrians uh, from the sidewalk. I then continue and I run into this uh, uh, graphite colored tactile strip, which allows for those with disabilities to feel that they're entering a street section. From there, I enter the roll curb gutter. Uh, this is made so I can easily glide across on my bike. The street level has been raised up and it allows for this next level of concrete uh, which was added. It's very colored. It's been tooled, creates some sound, uh, and allows me, the user, to 
access this space safely and for cars to recognize that it's not just for them. So we're here in the narrow section of the corridor we call the Narrow Canyon. This space is only about 55 feet wide north to south. So it limited our design in adding trees to this section of the Greenway. One way we mitigated the lack of trees was by adding in these angled trellis fences. We have some hops that is done very well so far this summer. Climbed up the angled trellis and it's starting to dangle down just like we wanted it to and created that overhead kind of green tree-like effect. It goes with that motif of the canyons as you descend from say Alta to the Great Salt Lake. Some sections of the canyons are very narrow so our plantings kind of mimic plants that you would find in those types of conditions where there's a lot of water, there's a lot of rocks, not a lot of open space to spread out. So we came up with this design scheme to find plants that meet these narrow conditions. As you can see behind me, the track actually takes a big curve slightly to the southwest and it lended itself to a design theme we called the river bend. River bend we looked at landscapes or areas where rivers would really meander and bend and what kind of landscape conditions those presented and a lot of what we'll see down this river bend very lush, uh, very shrubby, lots of, um, lots of willows, grasses, meadowy like a, an old oxbow or, or riverbend. Part of this design motif for the riverbend, we have, again, specific plantings. Uh, you can see some larger boulders that the artist installed. To us, they also represent kind of a river shadow, uh, something that you see after large boulders, plantings, when the river dries up, uh, the vegetation that grows up behind those river shadows. Uh, we have some hyssops, some irises that we'll see, some geraniums, and one of our favorite pieces are these scarlet curl willows. These are very interesting trees that uh, you can see there's a nice curl in the branch, a curl in the leaf, uh, but though not truly native to this area, the willow represents a lot of the willows that you would see in the Intermountain West landscapes around rivers. This sculpture that you see here is uh, in the shape of a sugar cube house because the neighborhood that it's in is called Sugar House. There's two of them. There's this, this one that represents sugar cubes and across the street you'll see a pink one that re represents salt from the Great Salt Lake. They're actually uh, from a trestle wood bridge for the trains that went across the Great Salt Lake. They were in, in the water soaking the salt of the Great Salt Lake for a hundred or so years. We cut them so that we had the flat surfaces because I, I like to have a flat front representing painting and that's why I call them builds for the German meaning of the word meaning picture um, and also the, the pun on to build in English because they're actually sculptures. So these two builds are placed here at this block across from each other uh, to represent the progression from the theme down the mountain, mountain meadow, river bend to the city block. As a pedestrian is walking this way, they're sort of welcomed into the, the city section of, of the S-Line through these, uh, these sculptures. Bocce goes way back even to the pharaoh times, but the Italians claim it back in the Roman times and they used to play with pebbles and rocks and um, it, it has gone on through the centuries and become a backyard game kind of similar to that of, of playing croquet. And like Tony Zucca was the one who started the Bocce Association in Salt Lake City and he was a double amputee and he loved the game. He could play it from his chair and he said if I can play anybody can play and so that was kind of the slogan that was said, and you only had to be an Italian heart. You didn't have to be Italian to play. Anyone can play. It's just a matter of tossing out the little white ball out there called a polina, and whoever can toss their bigger ball closest to it is the one who wins the game. That's the bottom line. Okay, these are the three balls we play with. I mean, there's more of the red and there's more of the green, but we only have one of the white. 
and that one is tossed out way down the court and the goal is to get your ball the closest to it and then the goal of the guy competing with you is to see if I can do it knock you out of the way and sometimes you get lucky and they hit you a little bit closer and then they get down there with little tape measures to see who's the closest and that's who's won the game So along this section of the greenway, uh, we have what, we, what we've titled a, a Voonrif. It's a Dutch term for a shared road. What that means is on this path that I'm on right now, cyclists, uh, pedestrians, track right in front of me, and also uh, motorized vehicles can share this, this section of the greenway for access. Mostly that happened because of the industrial complexes behind me that they uh, uh, that needed continual access to run their businesses so we came up with some different design uh, characteristics to help all three of those uh, users feel safe in this section of the corridor again because this is mostly a pedestrian and cycle path we wanted to be safe uh, as cars then entered that space as well In the early settlement of this valley, uh, our blocks were designed at uh, a furlong, so 660 feet. And from my bicycle to myself is about one twelfth the scale of a Salt Lake City block. In that block, you had houses on each corner with crop plantings in between and maybe some traditional landscaping that they would have brought with them because a lot of those people were from England and Eastern US and so they had those type of landscapes in mind as they settled this valley. I find myself next to one of these twisty baby locust trees. We selected this tree for a couple reasons. One, uh, its position in the landscape and in this distance represents where houses first would have been uh, when they were developing the landscape uh, in the early settlement of the Great Salt Lake Valley. It also represents the first trees that were planted in the valley, which were black locust trees. Uh, they planted those for symbolic reasons, telling themselves that they were here to stay because black locusts are slow growing trees, uh, take a long time to mature before you could harvest the wood. And so to them, it meant we're staying put and we're here uh, to settle this valley. We chose granite. Uh, based on the nickname, the Granite Line, that was the old nickname for the railroad that uh, went up Little Cotton Canyon to the Granite Mines to take granite down here to the valley to construct the temple. And we uh, showed that with a literal interpretation of kind of 
a line of granite boulders throughout this mile. Uh, many of them are seating elements. This is kind of one of the major seating elements of granite. We have some sculptures made of granite and, uh, and then other railroad Utah themes throughout uh, our sculptures. So in this in map engraving showing our, our valley, uh, X marks the spot where we're standing right here. Uh, this represents the new S line, and uh, which also is the old Rio, uh, Denver and Rio Grande Railroad that goes Harley's Canyon. This is an important canyon up here, Little Cottonwood Canyon. This is where uh, the granite mines were and where they took granite from the granite mines and took them down here to Temple Square. So the Greenway is complete. We've designed it, we've created the space, it's been constructed. And what, what's next for this space is redevelopment. Uh, the investment that the cities have put in was done for a reason. That was to spur redevelopment along the corridor. As we've seen, there's some older buildings, there's some dilapidated buildings, there's some underutilized landscapes and the desire is to see that space redevelop over time adjacent to this greenway. I'm going to be visiting often as a patron and seeing that this landscape is maintained over time and is nourished, especially as it continues to grow and develop. What we're, you know, what we're hoping to achieve in the next 30 years is an extensive track system that can be utilized by, you know, all of the residents of Salt Lake City. Already seen a lot of development in Sugar House and in South Salt Lake around the streetcar line. So this is not only a way to bring people to the city and connect the city together, but it's also a development tool that the city is using uh, to develop, you know, parts of the city. Uh, make these communities more livable, more walkable, and more friendly. So that's the ultimate vision, I think. The end of the line, as far as we go.